Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. And welcome to a ghostly me. I'm recorded after dark because I'm doing it on the way home. And it is now dark at five o'clock. The clocks have uh, gone back. Uh, so now it's, uh, we're going home at six o'clock and calling it five o'clock. So I don't know if you can see anything. Did you hear that beep? That was it. That was the five o'clock beep. So, um, and there's no CCTV on, there's no camera on the, this car so I'm afraid you're not even going to get treated to a bunch of rear view lights but anyway there's a couple of things that have cropped up so oh, let me just take this phone out of my pocket got another phone that uh, I wanted to just have a chat about and um, they both relate to dentistry the first one is the um, NHS.net which is a secure messaging system that's used across the NHS mm. as a whole and uh, there was a long, uh, it was a long time before dentists could get uh, a, an at NHS net um, email. But uh, especially if you're a private practice like us. Um, but you know, it's to the patient's benefit to have an NHS net address because, um, yeah, I know what you're doing. Actually, that's quite clever. I might do that. No way. And I was uh, they think they're doing a shortcut, but I'm not going to bother now. So, um, yeah, so obviously if you send something at NHS net to another, to an NHS practitioner, then it, you know, they tend to sort of be a bit more sympathetic because they're all uh, comrades in arms, you know. So, um, whereas if it comes from an external email address, then in the early days, your email just used to get deleted. The firewall on the NHS wouldn't let external messages in uh, obviously just in case they contained attachments that had viruses and stuff like that now they're a little bit more um, tolerant about people emailing nhs.net addresses from non-nhs.net addresses but um, anyway and I might have to go back to doing that but I'll explain to you quickly why okay so we went through we jumped through a load of hoops to get um, nhs.net addresses and we got them for uh, most of the, you know, the movers and the shakers within the practice. And also, you get given one for the practice. So the practice as a whole gets an NHS net address. And, um, which is a pain in the doodah because, like, for example, supposing I wanted to request an OPG, then, uh, and I send it, then I have to remember whether I've sent it from my personal NHS email or from the practice NHS email. Or you have to make up your mind which one you're going to, you're going to use. And it matters a lot, right? Because um, they have a, I suppose, they must have quite a high turnover of um, staff. So, and they, they have local administrators who, um, you know, administer the hospital, for example, if you're working. And what they'll do is, every week they'll sign up everyone who's got a job at the hospital that week. And then they'll... Um, leave they'll sign you know they'll less more less likely to delete everyone who's left um so what happens is they have a mechanism whereby if you don't use your email for 30 days then it gets deleted and we suffered from this this is why i decided that uh somebody rang from bristol and said that he needed some antibiotics and they said could i email a prescription through to this nhs.net address the pharmacy and i thought i know what i'll do i'll um I'll do that from my NHS net address, you see. Perhaps it might make things a bit easier. Anyway, I couldn't log in. So it turns out that I'd fallen foul of this rule that if you don't use your email for 30 days, it gets deleted. Now, now by deleted, I don't mean archived or inactivate, deactivated. They literally just throw the effing thing away. And I don't know what's happened to all the content in there. I mean, it was full of archived requests for OPGs and OPGs that I had received and messages that I had received. And that I was like, you know, well, can we reactivate it? See, now I have to contact the NHS helpline, the main helpline, because obviously being a private practitioner, I don't have a... Go on, go on. I don't have a, an administrator I can turn to. I'm my, I'm my own administrator. 
and you also to get an NHS net address you have to pass like a 24 page information technology exam which is you know like do you store credit card numbers do you what is your backup policy blah 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 so so I've done all that but they've still deleted now because my personal email was deleted that left the practice email account with no emails associated with it and so therefore I couldn't log on to that because I didn't have a, a way to get into it now that I think has been reactivated um, but the but, but apparently everything that I uh, did on my old I was Derek dot Watson one I think and now I'm now Derek dot Watson five or whatever which is you know Derek dot Watson lost lost all his emails now the reason why I'm so aerated and I appreciate this is a boring story okay this is a boring story the moral of the story is don't get an NHS.net address okay don't fill in the bloody 24 page application do not ring up the national assistance helpline do not get an NHS address because they don't care and not only that they are in deleting the address what they've done is they've put into train a series of events which is a, a fairly long and, and quite reasonably polite but obviously extremely frustrated and, and slightly irate telephone conversation with me telling them that I've never heard of an email address that had to be used every 30 days or it got completely annulled you know and I got completely deleted on all the contents I mean I do know that they like doing that in the public sector you know for example if you ask for the chief dental officer's diary uh, for the last three months the day before she retires then you will get given it if you ask for it the day after she retires or leaves the job you'll get told it's been deleted uh, and you're not entitled to it So, that then has to be escalated to a level 2 support query, because the level 1 technicians basically are just sitting there helping people who have forgotten their passwords all day, but someone who's literally had an account deleted needs to be escalated to someone who can, who can create a new account, you know, so it's a, it's, it goes up, so, and it takes three or four days, and of course in the meantime I've, um, I've had to give this bloke a prescription and send it from the practice email at angry.net, wherever it is. And, uh, and so he's got his prescription, but uh, and it didn't make any difference to the pharmacist. The pharmacist presumably got, got the email without it being an NHS net address. So in future, I'm just gonna stick to it. So not only have they um, royally uh, hacked me off, not only have they incurred all the expense of a level one phone call uh, for half an hour, which must have cost them five pound, even assuming they're paying the person minimum wage, cost them five quid. Then they've let escalate it to level two, who've recreated the account, which I have now decided I'm not going to use. Because it's, you know, I just can't, honestly, it's not worth doing anything through the public sector because it's, it's done in the least efficient way possible and the most expensive way possible and the most time wasting way possible so you know I mean I had I asked I sent someone to the local hospital for an OBG and uh, they've written back believe it or not and asked for an extension to the month that they're allowed to send the OPG back on the basis that it's a complicated procedure and it requires drawing information from a load of different sources and uh, therefore they want uh, an extra month on top of the month. Now I think they're treating that as a subject access request. I don't think they understand that I've just sent a letter in asking them to take an x-ray and all they need to do is send me back the x-ray. They want a clinician to sign it off they probably want a radiographer to report on it. Now, I don't need that. I am the clinician. I am going to do the report on it. I just want the effing DICOM file. 
even a JPEG would be all right. I'll tell you what, I'm pleased you can't see me. <laughs> if you think I'm glowing red, it's not the reflect, I'm not basking in the reflected glow of the tail lights. I am actually literally incandescent. I am glowing red. So, what else was I going to say? Something else that, that possibly might be a bit more used to you. And that is I had a so-called newsletter through from my indemnifiers. Who I won't embarrass by telling you they are. Because they're actually normally they're quite good. In fact, they're too good. Because, uh, you know, if you ring them up for a simple question, they're like, oh, uh, we need to know what patient it's in respect of. Uh, what's their date of birth? Can you send us their notes? Can you send us their x-rays? And I'm like, like, no, I just wanted a simple answer to a simple question. It doesn't apply to a particular patient. It was a generic question about um, power of attorney in respect of health. And uh, they're like, well, we have to open a case. And I'm like, no, you don't, actually. You, you want to open a case because you get... That's just your pathway, to use the modern phrase. Do you know what I mean? It's like, they're like, everybody who comes in with a question, we need the following information. And uh, so you can't write, a, you can't ring them. So it deters you from ringing them and asking them some stupid question. Because, I mean... <clears throat> I would have liked to have asked them because they are lawyers and I'm paying them and it's their job to answer questions like that for me I, but instead I ended up googling it and you know I don't see why I should have to google it that's why I rang them because I thought to myself I don't need to google this I got some bloody lawyers on the payroll I'll ring them up and ask them but <coughs> <coughs> believe me by the time I had gone through their third degree, I was like, I don't want to, forget I asked, forget, literally forget I asked, delete everything, step away from the phone, and they were sending me emails three months later saying, you know, with regard to your inquiry, uh, you know, we have left the file open so that in the future, should you uh, uh, wish to reopen the case, then we'd be more than happy to uh, give you the advice that you need. And I, I, this is after I told them, literally, I got the advice that I needed from somewhere else, and could they please close the file and stop bothering me? Because they send you every, uh, every week they send you an email saying, we haven't received the patient's details. We haven't received the patient's file. We haven't received the patient's x-ray. You know, so I'm like, all right. I don't want to put you in my spam filter, so just calm down, wind your neck back in, and uh, stop trying to justify the large amounts of money that um, you charge. So anyway, so they've done this newsletter, which, and we used to, when I was uh, Chief Executive of the GDPA, we used to produce a magazine every month. And I, so I can, I can understand that, that someone said, oh, why don't we put out a newsletter to stay in touch? And if they did, and it was interesting, then I would read it. But it's usually a single sheet of paper, two-sided, or two sheets of A4 PDF. And, and half of it is a picture, and, and a quarter of it is, a, is their masthead. And the other quarter is their contact details. And then the con content is literally 60 words on the back, of which 20 are restating that you know, what the, the article's supposed to be about. 20 are just saying, uh, we give advice individually, so if you have any queries, please contact us. And then uh, 20 in the middle of the most generic advice that really, you know, that you know anyway. And this particular one was on complaints, how to deal with complaints on social media. You know, if someone gives you a one-star review. Now, we did have a patient who did give us a one-star review. And the reason was that uh, he uh, 
he paid in advance for his treatment. It was on a Monday. And then uh, it snowed over the weekend. So he got snowed in where he was. And so he couldn't get back in time. He was expecting to drive back on the Monday morning. And probably by Saturday night, it was quite obvious that he wasn't going to be able to get back. But he didn't bother to ring us or let us know. He just didn't turn up. And then what we did was we then we charged him as if he had turned up, which is part of our terms of service. And uh, he got very cross because he thought that it wasn't his fault that he couldn't come. And we thought that it wasn't our fault that he couldn't come either. So I don't see why we should, we should have to pay for his inability to get to us. Anyway, we disagreed and uh, as well, we charged him. So as a result, he gave us a one star review. So he didn't do it under his own name. He invented a new Google Gmail uh, address. And so we got this one star review from from an, uh, a persona, you know, an alias that had only ever given one review to anybody and it was our one star review. And so, and so that's how we knew that it was him. I mean, it was, you know, uh, dentist surgery is not that big that you don't know who's done what. Anyway, um, so I replied in the, in the way you get a chance to reply, I said, this is a, a vexatious, a frivolous and vexatious review from a patient who um, didn't turn up for his appointment and thought that he should be able to do it without getting charged. So anyone who reads that review, well, it wasn't really a review, it was only like a one star, uh, and all they can read now is our comment. So I hope that it helps people understand why we got like 99% of our reviews literally are five star and we've got one one star review. Um, it sort of provides some context, you know. But the um, this uh, indemnity society was saying like contact us, you know, because I think that what they've done is they've had a few inquiries from people saying, I've had one star reviews and uh, what can I do about it you know typically can I ring up Google and ask them to insist that they delete it because we obviously not don't deserve it and it doesn't matter really what service uh, the one star review is on they almost never will delete a one star review uh, because you know unless unless you can prove it's literally from an account that's just spamming one star reviews or uh, is abusing the, their terms and conditions in some other way. Um, because one, uh, getting a one star review is a very powerful reminder that you should be up in your game, you know, in terms of service level. So, and that's so that's the first thing I would think is that if you've got a one star review, then it might be vexatious, which it was in our case. Or it may be that the patient is um, genuinely thinks that your service deserves a one-star review, which I, you know, possibly you can say argue that in our case that was that was the case as well. You know, he really felt that he uh, shouldn't have been charged for not turning up, and therefore our service was really bad because we should do free uh, patient fail to attend appointments. So. Anyway, whenever anyone posts a review on our web, well, if they, they, they get a chance to post a review internally, in which case the review goes up on our website, um, we, we put them up, and when we get a hundred or so, we put them up. Um, and then, um, or they can post a review to Google, in which case, uh, obviously we then can't change them, but we do comment on every single one. and. Fortunately, as I say, over 99% of them are five-star reviews. I think overall we've got a 4.6 plus with, with, with a ton of reviews. Um, and uh, but what, what, when we get notified that someone's given us a review uh, of any time, we always post a comment. Always, always, always. Now, what you can do is you can't give any more information. Than they've already given. So, supposing they're posting as uh, Fred, you can put, dear Fred, thank you for your review, blah blah blah. Or if they post as AH, you can put, dear AH, but you can't put, dear uh, Anthony Harold, whatever. If that's they haven't revealed that information, so you mustn't. That's a breach of confidentiality. But 
that's a simple thing. Uh, and you can even put Dear Anonymous. But I always put something like, uh, you know, thank you so much for your five star review. We really appreciate the positive feedback. It cheers the staff up. Uh, we're so pleased we were able to help you with your smile. And, uh, you know, that you know, we, we achieved a, a positive result after visiting five dentists. You know, just, just repeat the stuff that they put in. Don't give away anything that's in their notes. Don't say, oh, by the way, you know, uh, you know, we do remember that you had come from my dentist up the road and, and, and that you said it was a buttload of crap. So we're glad that we've managed to restore your faith in dentists. Just, uh, just uh, generic stuff, honestly. Chat GPT is brilliant at this. If you really, really get stuck, if you're used, if you're the sort of person that can't write Christmas cards or can't write birthday cards, then get fire up the old Chat GPT. Get go to Bing. Or is it no? What is it? Uh, go to uh, uh, Bard B A R D dot Google dot com or go to Bing, which offers you ChatGPT as standard, and and just say, look, write a thank you note, a 50 word thank you note to a patient who has left a positive review on a dental website. And what what they will do is it will, it will literally just, it'll be a bit Americanized and it'll be a bit, what's the word, corny, so you might have to decornify it a bit, but uh, it will get you started. That's the main thing. So I'll give you a, a framework to get going with. So there are things that you can do, as I say. And if, let's say, the patient says, you know, I was very unhappy with the treatment here, then you've got to write straight away, write straight away and say, look, I'm so sorry to hear that you're unhappy with the treatment. And we are going to do whatever it takes to make sure that your concerns are addressed. And in the first instance, you, you, if you ring the surgery, we'll give this, you know, our early attention. Or if you go to our website, you'll see that we have a formal complaints procedure which uh, we will be more than happy to um, deal with any complaint that you might have and, and ensure that you're totally happy, along those lines, right? Now, the, the reason that that is a good idea is because anybody, any patient who comes after and reads that review is going to go from saying, oh, look, there's, there's a really bad review about this dentist here, to saying, Oh my God, these dentists, they are so upset that anyone was unhappy. They are so obviously concerned to make sure that they provide a good service that they've offered to see the patient again and, and uh, taken through the formal complaints procedure, blah, blah, blah. If they've got anything, if there's anything gone seriously wrong. And so they'll come away with a very positive uh, impression of you. They'll, you'll be able to change someone who looks at that review you'll be able to change their impression of your practice from a negative impression to a very positive impression just by replying and <coughs> excuse me if you reply to every single one and not just the good ones and not all not just the bad ones if you reply to every single review again you'll get an even better impression because the patients will read it and say, my God, these, these guys, they follow their reviews really closely. They reply to every single review. And also, if somebody is going to post something on the review, they will think to themselves, well, I better just be a bit truthful and honest about what I post about these guys because I, they're going to reply to me straight away. You know, they're going to read this probably today. And next thing you know, I'll have a, I'll have a, a reply up. Well, uh, it also encourages patients to leave you good reviews because they think, oh, I'm wasting my time typing in a good review in here. But it's not a waste because they're going to be spending as much time saying thank you for our lovely review. So 
So I'm doing something nice and it's being appreciated, you know? So, uh, <clears throat> so, so you make them think twice about uh, posting bad reviews because, you know, they're going to get called out on it. Somebody's pulled in there, and I'm, that's exactly where I want to go. So he's gonna, yeah. Unfortunately, you're gonna get in my way, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. So there you go. That's what I would say. And also, if you if you are if you've got a lot of reviews and a lot of good reviews, then people will be more inclined to leave you a good review. Especially if you were, you know, something like, you know, please help us out, please support the practice or whatever with a review, then basically that's sort of code for give us a good review, isn't it? Don't just say please review the practice, say please help the practice with a review. And then <clears throat> they'll think, I know what they want, they want a good review. And a good review is a five star review, really. And that's what we get. Anyway, so there's two bits of practical help for you there. One on NHS net emails, don't bother. And one on, on really how to deal with uh, negative reviews. Uh, which is a darn sight more helpful, I'll tell you, than the newsletter that the indemnity people sent through. And God knows what they'd say if I rang them up and asked them how to deal with a negative review. They would, I'd never, it'd take them three months to draft me a reply. Do you know what I mean? All right, lovely, nice to see you. You can't see me, I can't see you. Bye.